Now, the uh, formulation of the Super 8s is going to be known by the end of this weekend, and I suppose one of the key fixtures that we're looking forward to is that all Connacht clash taking place in Munster. It's Galway versus Mayo at the Gaelic Grounds, and we're joined on the line to look ahead to that game by Billy Joe Padden and Michael Meehan. Uh, Michael, if I can turn to you first, because I guess the narrative around football championships for so long has been dominated by Mayo, which A, is going to be to the frustration of a lot of Galway people and especially a lot of Galway football people and B overlooks the achievements that Galway have had perhaps in getting to this stage Yeah, hi lads um, a little bit uh, Richie I suppose we would, there's nothing new in the last number of years with, 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 the, with the attention around Mayo footballers and it's, it's all been very much warranted um, over their you know in uh, given their their All uh, Ireland runs over the past number of years, so um, and again, you know, they're they're just they're they're a crowd puller. They've, they're the, one of the best supported uh, teams in the country outside of Dublin, probably bar none. And um, you know that that always brings a certain amount of hype and, and fanfare. And and I suppose in the past there were times when you you try to actually use that to your advantage when you're coming up, coming up against Mayo. Um, but you know they're they're a hardened outfit now. And from a goal perspective, you know they've. They've just they they limped into the, the the back door system this year and they have their opportunity now, albeit a massive task on, on Saturday evening and it's um you know, it's an intriguing fixture, it's something to really look forward to. Uh, there's a lot going on and it's not just a straight up match, it's so, so many injuries on both teams. Um it's much more than that and it's it's a big fixture in the context of, you know, what happens for for the loser and, and the impact that it's going to have on the team that doesn't, that doesn't win on, on Saturday evening. Mm. For Galway, I suppose that sense of not necessarily being the underdog, but the focus is less on them coming into this game. So in, in a way, that's probably going to suit them better. Their preparations are done in quiet and they can come into this game with the same level of intensity and the same level of scrutiny that may have been, uh, have had attached to them in the past couple of weeks. Yeah, that's true. Uh, of, of, of recent days, it, it's all, it, a lot of it is Mayo. Um, since the weekend, Galway took a lot of flack in the in the aftermath of the uh, Connacht final, and, and probably rightly so. In some in some uh, in, uh, instances, um, you know, their, their second half performance was very limp, and it was very disappointing, you know, for, for the players' management and and, uh, and supporters as well. So there was a bit of heat at that stage on Galway, but they've had a, I think that's, that'll be three weeks, if not maybe four, come come Saturday evening. So they've had time to get back to the club. Played around of championship and and yeah, I suppose cleared ahead initially. When you're such a disappointing um, performance like that in, in a big game, uh, oftentimes you know the answer is for last to get back to their clubs and just you know you take a break from it uh, in, in a certain to a certain extent and um, and get a game under their belt and then come back in. Hopefully, having having done their analysis and and and, and plan, plotting and planning for what was to come, and they were only ever going to have five six days of information on, on their opponent. Mm. Um, that said, it's probably fair to say that Kobe would have been keeping a close eye on Mayo and maybe expecting to have played them in the Connor Championship uh, this year, um, uh, except for Ross Common and their and their their big win against Mayo and their subsequent big win against Galway. Has a finger been put on what went wrong in that second half against Ross Common? Oh, a hundred thousand fingers have been have been pointed and put on different things, but it's it's hard to get a grasp. But a couple a couple of things like stand out, and it's just maybe the nature of their five point victory at halftime might might have flattered them. After twenty minutes, it was pretty much even. Stevens five all, and Roscommon were given as much as good as they got, and then Galway got a got a run and got a couple of good scores. You know, worked worked patiently and won a few frees and and got scores. Just clocked up five quick points pretty quickly in the run up to half time. Um, second half then is was a case of just Galway didn't you know couldn't get on the ball and and I suppose when you can't get on the ball you're not winning your kickouts you're not winning breaking ball uh, they lost ball in the tackle they were turned over and they, they just were were um, were dominated by by Roscommon completely in that second half and primary possession uh, possession for me was, was the main thing that they just couldn't secure enough of their own kickouts and and they couldn't or or, or any breaking ball in that central area and and as a result they just sort of seemed to retreat um, into themselves and, and, and Ross Common got their goal at a good time and, and they just grew and grew and, and just played it on, on, on their terms um, so like being out fought it was, was the big thing in that second half for me um, and I'm sure it's, it's something it hasn't happened Galway for a long time now and it certainly hasn't happened Galway against Mayo for a long time um, so I have a feeling there's going to be a big 
a big push on that, you know, from Kevin and even from the players themselves that, you know, any time they've, they've gotten on well against Mayo, they, they've outfought them on the pitch, they've worked hard there, you know, they've stood up to them and uh, they've been aggressive. And we're going to have to see an awful lot of that on Saturday evening for, for Galway to be successful. Billy Joe, there's a sense that Galway are coming into this game as a wounded animal, whereas Mayo are just straight out wounded. Um, <laughs> there's a, a heavy chance that if you rock up to the Gaelic grounds on Sunday with the Mayo jersey, you might actually get a game, uh, such as the level of injuries uh, associated with the side now at the minute. Th- they've been crippling over the past while, and with they had no shape potentially out of this game as well, Lee Keegan almost certainly out of it too. Like, <laughs> things aren't easy for Mayo at the moment. Definitely not easy. Uh, just really been dealt some bad luck with injuries that are unavoidable, mm. uh, whether it be broken wrists or, you know, rolling your ankle. But it's it's unfortunate that it's happened to so many key players and key players, particularly in that middle third. Uh, Jim O'Connor is going to be a loss. You know, Matthew Ruan uh, with his collarbone. Um, that He's a massive loss because he was going so well. But at the same time, you have to kind of uh, be impressed to some extent with the way Mayo even some of their senior players have just battled on and got on with it because with that Lee Keegan injury just before half time against our, 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 our team that were performing really well they could have easily put the head down but it was actually some of the senior players Aidan O'Shea's Kevin McLaughlin Jason Doherty that actually really lifted their performance level at that stage and uh, were really critical for me on that third quarter where they where they were ma- managed to get a lead but in saying that going into a game against Galway where uh, uh, Michael's right that Galway will be very physical they have been in the past they've been able to frustrate Mayo Mayo are going to have to be as aggressive and as physical back and be able to win that primary possession around the middle of the field and hold on to it for as long as they can because I think the way this Mayo team can go about beating Galway will be by gaining possession being patient with it and slowly breaking Galway down and trying to create enough scores to win the game um, because that's exactly what Roscommon did in the second half of that kind of final and, and maybe that's the template for, for Mayo going into this game. Yeah, being able to uh, to boss that kind of middle third is, is going to be key to them and obviously Aidan O'Shea would potentially be a crucial part in that as fitness emerging as a concern as we know ahead of the weekend's game and something that Ger and former Meath captain Anthony Moyles spoke about on this morning's OTB AM. Is there any prospect that they think, look... We can't win in All Ireland if we have an unfit uh, O'Shea, and we might be able to get through Galway without him. Do you take the risk? No, no. I don't take the risk either. But no. you take the risk I'd... in the Dudley Gall game afterwards and say, "Look, we can't win in All Ireland without him, but we can lose the first game and then try and win the last two. Correct. Or the Kerry game, whatever. Well, whichever. Yeah. So yeah, you've, you've, Kerry you've, first. you've done a goal, Kerry. <laughs> Themselves and then it'd be either meat or Claire. So you're probably saying to yourself, well, listen, we'll have a good rattle of two of these. And um, I'd certainly be saying, if Donegal, which, who's first? Kerry in Killarney. Okay, you probably have to win that one. Well, you have to win the other two then if you lose that one. Mm. So, Well, if you're ranking, the, there, you've, done, you've done a goal at the top there. You do, yeah. Going on, going on. And, and um, okay, you play Kerry in Killarney. Doing all at home, it looks like, and then the main game is, um, or the other game is in uh, Croker. Yeah, yeah. So I, 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 look, I think you have to just continue to play him. I think it's, I think it's tricky to, you know, leave him out, bring him back in. Um, but this is an enormous game for it. So you know, they'll need all hands to the pump on this one. Billy Joe, you're risking him on Saturday. Yes, of course, he has to play. Um, unless now he's phys- it's physically impossible for him, but even if he's carrying an injury, carrying a knock of some sort, um, he has to play because I don't think Mayo can win the game without him. We're, a minute ago we were talking about physicality and being aggressive mm-hmm. and winning possession around the middle of the field, and Mayo can't do that without Aidan O'Shea. So I, unless he's in a situation where he can't play any minutes at all, uh, well then you have to play him and I, I think he, he, he probably he's aware of that I think the other players in the team are aware of that and I'm sure Galway are aware of that so I'm, I expect them to expect him to play um, and it, it's the risk you have to take and I suppose it's the difficulties that you find yourself in when you don't win a Connacht kind of Championship and you have to run that roulette of, of playing week after week in the qualifiers and really the injuries are adding up for Mayo and when you look at it at the two teams and I know that there's been talk about some Galway players or Galway having injury problems as well, um, you would expect Galway to go in as the fancied side considering the, all the players that may or miss. Mm. Michael, if you see Aidan O'Shea with the talk that he's rolling around with a, a cast or a protective boot on his right foot uh, this week, yeah. if you see him lining out in the starting 15 and the, at the gated grounds on, on Saturday, what are you thinking? Are you thinking this lot are desperate and they really need to get over the first 15 minutes? Or are you thinking, all right, we're actually in for a game here? I think 
I, I'm sure the man himself, like he's having a phenomenal year. He's been, he's been key man for, for Mayo all, all season uh, so far. And I, I, I fully expect to see him out there <laughs> unless he's practically going around on one leg. And what I'm thinking is that he's just going to bring the fight probably for as long as he can sustain. Um, I, I'm not sh- sure of the nature of the injury or, or the potential injury. Uh, it could be very much protective. But um, he, I, I'd ex- fully expect him to be setting the tone for as long as he can in around the middle. It, it's the area of the field that is, is key. It's, it's the area of the field that always struggles a, a lot with against Roscommon. And, and unless we see Paul Conway maybe making a return for Galway, um, uh, amongst uh, the certain injuries to Fintan O'Curry Tom Flynn uh, Kieran Duggan they, like that's always four midfielders over the last couple of seasons who are all um, in a little bit of bother so I think I, I would start him and I would look to get a, gain the stronghold there for as long as I could and, and put the pressure on uh, on the Galway like what Galway want to do is get ahead in this game and, 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 and try and pick Mayo off in the counter attack um, I think uh, and, and, and same for Mayo neither team will want to go behind so I think a big start is, is vital for whoever for whoever can pull it off and obviously Aidan O'Shea is going to be massive in that mm. uh, Speaking of O'Shea we're talking about him there and off the ball of course brought to you by Avancard powered by Mastercard should he start how do Galway go about counteracting that Michael? I know in the past um, different players have have pushed on him uh, at different stages. I, like we, I think it's a league game a couple, a couple last year in in Pierce Stadium. Damien Comer, in fact, came out and and and, and tracked him at length um, at different stages during each half. Uh, they'll be looking to get someone physical on him. Garrett Bradshaw has done that in the past as well um, from centre back, kind of when Aiden was maybe rotating between centre forward and midfield. So you'd be looking at lads like that again. Um, Demi Comer is unlikely to, to, to be involved from the start. I would I would expect Paul Conroy would be someone similar who could tag him, but has little or nothing done in the past year. Um, um, so you're looking at someone like Garrett Bradshaw, maybe Tom Flynn, if, if, if none of those guys are there. But what's impressed me most about him this year is he's been setting up plays, he's been putting in passes, nice you know kick kick passes for for assists, and he's kicked a couple of scores in the league as well. And um, you know that's that's the added extra to his game when he's out around the middle of the field when his confidence is up and it has been. Um, he poses that threat along with the you know the physical dominance that he brings to the to the middle third. Mm. Um, Billy Joe, we mentioned in terms of trying to be uh, dominating around the middle thirds um, a lot so far. Kickouts are obviously going to play a huge part in that. Mayo were forced to go short a lot of the time against Armagh, and something you pointed out as well. Uh, given the nature of Armagh's proficiency uh, in winning the high ball, what way do you expect them to set out at the Gaelic Grounds on Saturday? I think Armagh have set a good template for Galway. Um, I think the difference being that Galway will be able to put pressure on Mayo's midfield for the long kickout because it's it's fairly obvious that they're going to try and hit Aidan O'Shea. It's a huge strength that he has. What Mayo haven't done well is they haven't picked up the breaks in and around Aidan O'Shea in either of the last two qualifier games against Down or Armagh. But I think the big disappointing thing for Armagh is they weren't able to stop David Clark being able to get short kickouts out to Chris Barrett or to Keith Higgins or Brendan Harrison to then work it up the field. I expect Galway to be much better at that. So it may be more difficult for, for Mayo to get that ball out because you just look at the, the Galway forward line, whoever they play there, whether it's O'Lee and um, if Comer, whenever he's on the field, Shane Walsh, they'll be much more alert to David Clark's short kickouts. So I, I think what you're going to see from Mayo's point of view is that they're going to they're going to have to be much better on the breaking ball and at Galway will see this as a real opportunity to put pressure on the Mayo kickout, play more of the game in the Mayo half because I think as Michael pointed out rightly, the second half against Roscommon, they just did not play enough football in the Roscommon half, didn't put enough pressure on the Roscommon kickout, which was a, a huge weakness of theirs. And I think that's something that Galway will really try and change for this game on Saturday night. And it'll be up to Mayo. I think the real onus will be on... Aidan O'Shea and those players in and around him, uh, Mikey Murray, to be able to win, pick up breaks and kind of gain possession from that and, and drive Mayo up the field as opposed to relying on the short kick out like they did for the vast majority of the game against Armagh. Murray's been one of those that's impressed actually this year, hasn't he? Yeah, he's a, he's a, he's a young player. He's, he's very athletic. He's uh, similar built to Matthew Ruan, who had a great league campaign. Um, it's it's always going to take a bit of time for a midfield pairing to get uh, used to each other. I think there has been some sort of dis- disconnect between the midfield players in terms of who's picking up the breaks or who's going for a ball. But he's very athletic, he's very physical, and he's kind of fearless in the way he approaches his game. He's not going to he's going to put his hand up and try and take the ball on 
And his contributions over the last two days have been generally positive. Mm. As regards uh, Michael, the Damien Comer issue, I mean, we've spoken a lot about Aidan O'Shea and whether or not he's fit enough to return, um, given the fact that it's a short term injury or possibly a short term injury, uh, given the fact that he suffered it probably last week. Uh, but Comer's missed so much of this championship season. Is it a risk to throw him back at the deep end, particularly at this stage? It's, it certainly is a risk if, if he hasn't got enough work done. And uh, I'm not privy to, to what he has or hasn't done. I know. Let's say the week after the Roscommon game, which will be two weeks this weekend, he came on for his club late on. He had 15 minutes, and I, I didn't see it, but apparently he, he looked he looked every bit the man who had been absent from from uh, any competitive football for for a number of months. He, remember, he hasn't he hasn't talked out this year yeah. um, at all for for club or county in in league or championship. So um, until until that Friday night a couple of weeks ago. So it, it all depends on how the last couple of weeks have gone for him. You know, if, if he. If he's done enough, maybe just to, to the reality is, if 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 he's if he's had a good two weeks, the most you're probably going to get out of him is, is, is spring him uh, midway through the second half. I, I can't see anything else happening. Is it a risk? Um, I hope not. You know, for himself because he, he's he's, reco- he's he's had a slow recovery. It hasn't it hasn't always gone his way over the over the springtime with the ankle injury that he picked up. Um, so it will be shame kind of to undo the good work, but. He seemed captain. He's leader. He's, his presence is, 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 was missed hugely against Roscommon. and it has been uh, all year. Um, I know he'd be dying to get on the pitch. Uh, I suppose is, Kevin will want him on the pitch, but uh, no one will want to put a, put a, an undue risk um, uh, with him. So I'd expect if we see him, you know, he, he's, he's going to be you know clear to play, and it's just whether or not. I suppose Damien's not the kind of man to stand in and, and, and shy away from things. If he goes in there, he's going to get stuck in on everyone and look for every ball. And maybe if he can feel his way into it a little bit, if, if he does come in just to kind of, if nothing else, he's, he'll draw heat off the likes of a Shane Walsh or an Ian Burke who may be close to him or a Michael Daly or whoever's still on the pitch at that stage. If, when Damien Coleman comes in, it's a, it's a lift for the crowd, if nothing else. And if, if he can you know, take a bit of heat from the other forwards in the Goy team, if he, if he only contributed that, I think there's an advantage to having him on the pitch for 10, 15 minutes. And, and if we can get him involved where maybe he is, maybe he has good work, enough good work done to, to contribute, then um, it's, it's a calculated risk. But I think if it's one... I de- I definitely be looking at using. There's a higher wire act for for Kevin Walsh to kind of manage there because, like you mentioned, I and mean, you can only imagine the the crowd noise that will come from the Galway yeah. uh, part when if he's to come on with 15 minutes to go and try and turn that game. On the other side of that, the game could be beyond them or near enough beyond them by that stage, and his introduction might be moot. So he's not better yeah. off if he does have a couple of good weeks under his belt. Throw him in. That level of dynamism could really unsettle Mayo, particularly given the injuries they've suffered over the last couple of weeks, and particularly the injuries they've suffered in defence. Yeah, that's a very good point, Richie. Um, it, it may be something that they say from the off now that you know the Mayo had a, had a physical game in, in under hot conditions last Saturday night. So let let's put the pen, let them put the, let's put them to the pen of their collar straight away. And and if he was to do that, he may look at at, at using Damien from the off. Um, and maybe holding someone else in reserve, but you know, I suppose Galway. The, the the thing for them is like they they have a big panel there, and and it would be a comp- it is a competitive panel except for the fact that they had a huge you know the ten or twelve lads who, who missed large chunks of the league. Now a lot of them are all back, but it just seems to me that as a player you always wanted the confidence of having played you know got two or three or four league games under your belt and gone well in in, in some of them and are, and and got a good training block in the championship. And they have a lot of players there, but they're just, they're, they just don't seem to, or it seemed in the kind of final that confidence, there was no confidence there um, in, in, in terms of how they played. And the lads they brought on, the Killian McDade and, and different people like that, who, who just, you know, are very good players, but had missed so much time that they couldn't come in and make the impact. So again, maybe we, two weeks later now, or three weeks since the last game, two weeks of, of training with, with one cleat, one week freed up for the club. You, you could be looking at Galway and I'm putting a big push on from the start and, and getting lads in at that towards the end. And if confidence has, has changed, if, if they're if they're in better form, Adrian Varley and these lads, that you know they may be the guys to kind of see out the game because um, it's going to go down to the wire in terms of of lads we're going to see coming on for both teams. You know, there's, there's going to be 
is going to be. I, I was writing down on, on a piece of paper there a couple of hours ago that the, the team that you could pick of the injured players for both teams is is quite exceptional, especially around the middle of the field. There's about eight lads there going for two midfield spots, so. Um, it's just a shame we're not going to see them all on the pitch on Saturday yeah it absolutely is uh, one person we could see in the pitch uh, Billy Joe is Keelan O'Connor I mean he definitely came on what was it 13 minutes gone in the second half uh, last time out mm-hmm. against Armagh brought a rousing response from the Mayo support there in Castle Bar on that night his absence to some has been puzzling throughout the course of the summer so far he's finally you know gotten his, his, his hair wet in terms of championship action do you expect him to start this coming Saturday and if so what's he going to offer and if he does start on the bench does it not leave Mayo a little bit short I think that what Mayo will do is they'll start either one of Killian or Andy Morn and we have the other one with reserve to have this perform the same act basically a big cheer from the crowd and provide some impact in the last 20 minutes I think the thing for Killian is that the benefit for him maybe and the advantage he have has over over Comer for Bowie is that Killian has 26, 27 minutes under the belt uh, in a real tough championship game against Armagh where he didn't do a whole lot from play, but he kicked a real pressure free at a real critical moment of that game for Mayo and that will give him confidence. Mm. That will get him back in the swing of things. So I think I, I, if I was going to call it, I'd call it, I think Killian's going to start. And I think it's a good to have his influence on the team when you consider that so many of the other male forwards that are playing well are young, whether it be Darren Cohen or Fionn McDonough. They're players that haven't a whole lot of experience. They probably haven't played in a game like the Galway game will be, where Galway will be physical and they'll have lots of bodies back and it'll be aggressive. And Killian is that leader in that area. He's you know been captain of the team in the past. He'll be able to help some of those younger players through it. And Mayo will need some of those young players to play well and they'll probably need Killian to play well if they're going to going to beat Goa because really the only thing that Mayo have in their advantage coming into this game is the two victories uh, they've had over the last two weeks because if anything Goa have shown that they can beat Mayo over the last number of years and it's it's, it's a known fact that Mayo struggle against I suppose you know deep line defences with lots of numbers back there and Mayo have got to show that they can show the patience and show the I suppose the evolution in their team that they can deal with it Yeah before I let you both go I want to touch on this um, John Horan missive from during the week uh, pretty much every time he opens his mouth he offers some degree of controversy <laughs> over the past number of weeks it seems uh, the GA president has said that these, uh, a back pass reel to the goalkeeper uh, could be put before Congress <clears throat> pardon me in October um, he's clearly it's something he's clearly uh, had a be in his bonnet about uh, Michael is this something that you see as a, a great ill across the game of football at the moment? It's something that needs such urgent surgery, or is no, it? no, Richie? No, I, I saw that. I, I know. I, I briefly scanned over an article where he he had, you know, he had the necessary statistics to back up the point that he was making. But I see that as as a regressive step. I, I know they are used maybe in some games, and it has been highlighted over the last couple of seasons. Maybe particularly during league matches in springtime when. The ball is going back to keeper's hand, you know, recycled from maybe a 45 or 50 yards out kick back to the keeper. But I think by and large, the, what the keeper has offered and, and how they've transformed the game. And, and even we, we talk about um, Tuxton, who's transformed the game to a certain extent. But all of a sudden now you have Niall Morgan kicking points from play. You have Rory Began getting up the field. You have lads popping up in club games and under 21, under 20 games. The keeper now, the role is evolving. And I think it's quite exciting. I think it's, you see teams pushing up, and Galway have done it in the past, whereby you know chasing the game, chasing the kick out, they'd push uh, Roy Lavelle against Ross Common, went right up at one stage. He was he was well up on halfway line, just to squeeze the space. And I think by by doing that move, you're just gonna you're just gonna make it a a very um, unattractive position for a lot of a lot of people to maybe potentially say, Do you know what, I'd love to go out there and be the next uh, Stephen Cluxton or David Clark. You know if. If their kind of if their hands are tied and all they're expected to do is is kick and catch and save, um, I think that's that's a backward step. Yeah, Billy Joe, from the outside looking in, I mean, when the back pass rule was brought into to soccer, it was because the time time was being killed by the goalkeepers. They were basically taking the steam out of any kind of game, and it was a, just a horrible thing to watch. Whereas that role of a back pass of the goalkeeper seems to be more uh, cyclical in the play. It's trying to basically recycle the ball, get another move going, possibly up the other flank. And I don't necessarily see the huge danger in uh, a back pass to a goalkeeper in the same way that there was in soccer 25 years ago. Well, I, I agree with you in that it doesn't. I don't think it wastes time. The thing that frustrates me about these 
sound bites to, sound bite to get out of Co-Park in terms of possible room changes. You know, what do they really want to achieve? What do they see as the problem in Gaelic football? To me, when he, somebody's proposing stop playing the ball back to the goalkeeper, it, they want it harder for defences to bring out the ball because that fullback that has the ball on, following a short kickout cannot go back to his goalkeeper. He has to beat his man or he has to find somebody else. So in theory, that should make it easier for the attacking team to create that t- turnover and win the ball back and create more scores. If that's what we want, well, then maybe not allowing a pass back to the goalkeeper is one mechanism of doing that. Uh, to me, it hasn't been articulated as to what we actually want in the game. What is wrong with the game? Is there is it too hard to create an, a turnover in the attack and half? And I think, I think it is for a lot of teams. I think most teams decide that it is too hard, and that's why you see very few teams that are good at pressurizing the opposition kick out when they decide to go short uh, because they're just not willing to put that enough bodies up the field. It will be easier if the uh, if that defending team or the kick out team do not have the option to go back to the keeper. I'm not saying it's the right thing to do. I'm not saying it'd make the game better. I think Michael's right. I think it'd definitely make the goalkeeping position less attractive for young players. Uh, but at the same time, I think you need to open up the debate and decide what's good in Gaelic football, what's not good, what do you want to change. For me, if there are more turnovers of possession, you're going to end up having a more exciting game of football because what people don't want to watch is they don't want to watch 25, 20 passes one after the other. They want to see the ball change in hands quickly mm. and they want to see scores. And if that's what we want, well, then we look at a whole range of options, not just banning kick, uh, passes back to the keeper, but other ones as well and, and have that debate properly as opposed to just drip feeding us or trying to experiment with these rules that kind of aggravate people and leave people uncertain about what way the game, shape the game is going to be in the next couple of years. Mm. Before we let you go, Michael, uh, a quick um, prediction on how Saturday evening is going to go. Yeah, it's a difficult thing to do, Richie. You just there's so many balls in the air in terms of you know players unavailable. The the the, the generic script that you'd be reading off for a go MA over the last number of years, you know, it was, it was by and large you had uh, you had the strongest players facing off against each other, um, and that's just that's just not the case anymore. And you know, there's a lot. They're coming in on very, very different angles, but I suppose yeah, you asked for a quick prediction. Yeah. I'm hoping for a big backlash in Galway. I, mean, I, I would be very disappointed if the players cannot deliver a big backlash based on their last forty or the last half of football that they've played this year so far. What was 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 their worst? Um, so I expect a huge, huge backlash on the back of that. And if you can couple that with the fact that they've great confidence um, and great knowledge of, of how to beat the current Mayo squad over the last number of seasons. If they can get back to their levels of, of, of what they've done um, with that re- in that regard, and it mightn't be pretty again on Saturday evening, but I suppose it'd be a case of sticking to what you know. And, and of late, Galway uh, have known how to beat this Mayo team, so I, I'm thinking that they can get over the line. Billy Joe, no doubt you're going for a comprehensive Galway victory. <laughs> nope, can't help you there, Richie. Um, I think on the low of averages alone, what is it? Galway won the last seven in a row. Surely yeah. Mayo are going to get one back. I think that the extra confidence that they have over having the two victories in two, diff- you know, two difficult games will be a real benefit to them. And I just think with Killian O'Connor coming back in there, with Aidan O'Shea playing and playing well, some of the defenders playing well, I think Mayo just going to get the do- job done in a very tight game. Billy Joe, I don't know if you're familiar with law of averages and how it's worked for Mayo in all out and finals for the championship <laughs> in the past number of years, but I'm not sure it's something you want to be leaning on. Um, <laughs> gentlemen, thank you so much for taking time out this evening to speak to us and enjoy the game on Saturday. Cheers, man. Cheers. Uh, and don't forget, last week we were live in Cork at St. Finbar's in association with Super Value. Now we are heading north to Cumann Luclas Gael Guidor in Donegal on Wednesday, the 10th of July. That's Wednesday week. We'll be talking all things Super 8s, Donegal, and Ulster football naturally. Nathan Murphy's going to be joined on the night by Eamon McGee, Kevin Casty, Brendan Deveni, and plenty more that we'll be announcing over the next few days. It's an exclusive off air event. So the only way to enjoy it is to be there on the night and you can get your tickets for it as well now at offtheball.com forward slash events. So thanks to Super Value.